Hiya! Welcome to this, my 92nd episode of Video Fuzzy. I'm your host, Terry J. Hammond, sifting my basket of media memories, and in this installment, titled Reunion, I encountered episodes of that Fox production for 20-05. Also, book reports on a couple of mysteries, music, celebrating longtime talk show host Johnny Carson, and in my current collection, a whole lot of who. Welcome to the show! He doesn't have it on video, does he? We'll find out together on Video Fuzzy. Hi again. Say, I know it's been a minute, and I do appreciate everyone's patience. I've taken several runs at this episode, and in all reality, you should know that I am just beat. I I can blame work things and family things and stress things, but much as I love sharing all these with you, my video fuzzies, there's part of me that says, you know, if I did an episode every hundred discs, I'd get them all cataloged for so much faster. Which, yeah, in all reality, my true zen with this project is playing with my archive and finding what I find. But... If I catalog much more than I do between episodes, I'd end up glossing over so much that I'd want to include. All the broad brushstrokes would be there, but look, my collection is so delightfully random, eclectic, surprising even. I found a clip of Fiona Apple singing Oh Soldier on The Tonight Show, and I was like, oh, who remembered I had this thing anywhere? All of a bunch of network and cable television I was following, all of a sudden a bunch of music videos I recorded while I got ready for work one day, or this bizarre, like, one of the first Tim and Eric things they ever ran on Adult Swim. I got part of a live recording of Jay-Z collaborating with Lincoln Park on the set. And I've been watching for Reunion to show up ever since I watched Harper's Island because I felt, well, for one thing, episode 76, where I talked about the first nine episodes of that series, Harper's Island, I feel like that's just about the strongest installment I've ever posted about anything. And not just for the deep cut and book review I included for Agatha Christie's at Bertram's Hotel. Unfortunately, Harper's Island crashed and burned by the finale, but at least I had that whole series archived so as to watch and determine that for myself. I suspect a reunion may have dropped off my radar before I bothered finding out who done it, but be fair, I was having a hell of a time getting off the ground, as you'll hear. Why not? Let's just get things going here with my fuzzy feature, Reunion. And now, the video fuzzy presents Fuzzy Feature. The year was 2006. Pluto was demoted to a dwarf planet. Saddam Hussein was tried and hanged for Saddam Husseining. And in the upper Midwest, a TV columnist at a regional daily was asserting that we had entered a new golden age of television. Me. That was me. I was basing this on the popularity of or slash audiences willing to put up with longer, more complicated story arcs. Shows like 24 and Lost told producers and audiences were craving televisual literature. Networks were rewarding increasingly DVR having viewers willing to invest the time, willing to return for long-form episodic dramas from one week to the next with deeper, more involved plot structures. One such entry was Reunion on Fox, four episodes of which I managed to archive in the set to discs 1555 and 1556. Reunion was a murder mystery. <laughs> Such a mystery we don't even find out who was murdered until episode 5. As we're introduced to this story, one group of six friends graduating high school in 1986 was killed, presumably by one of the other five, and the show is being so coy about who that is. Even at the service, the officiant, one of their classmates, is talking about not the deceased, but the friend group they were part of, when... If you think about it, since the body was murdered and the suspect list includes every one of those friends you're lionizing, isn't that kind of, well, weird? Particularly since the investigator is also actually at that service and begins his inquiries immediately afterwards, yes, even as the mourners were heading out toward the cemetery. The pilot episode, 1986, starts with her graduation, naturally, since... 2006 was a 20 year reunion. That's today, the present day 2006. In 1986, they were all graduating. These six friends broke away and had their own party, which, okay, I graduated in 1988, and at my one, a million relatives showed up. I guess there was some expectation that I'd be there. Well, at this particular party, one of them, Alexa Davos, Sam, is preoccupied with a pregnancy test she keeps passing, just as Sean Ferris says Craig, Sam's boyfriend, but not the father, is raising a toast to Dave Annapole as Aaron, Kyler Lee as Carla, Amanda Rigetti as Jenna, and Will Estes as Will, Craig's best friend, and oh yeah, probably is the father. Craig and Sam and Will, Aaron, Jenna, and Carla, two love triangles of a sort. Will slept with Sam when she was on a break with Craig. We were on the break! 
The other one is just pathetic. Aaron pines for the disinterested Jenna while Carla pines for Aaron. Not a love, more of a yearn triangle. Okay, well, Craig and Will are making a beer run in a Porsche and they're T-boned by a pickup truck. Craig is driving and had been drinking. Will was injured and had not been drinking much. They both take him to the hospital or getting patched up when the cops come in and wow, that pickup driver was banged up pretty good. Craig could be going away for a long time. Oh, Except Will takes the blame. First offense, barely been drinking, no big deal, right? Signs a plea deal, it's all good, yeah? Except the driver died and now it's vehicular manslaughter. Judge rejects the plea agreement and demands Will be locked up for a year. I know we only have an hour with these people in the pilot episode and all these characters had middle school with each other. It feels like all of them would have had breaks between study hall to talk about all this stuff. Well, Carla keeps not telling Aaron about her feelings for him. Aaron waits for a big year-end bash to confront Jenna about his feelings for her while she is flirting with the English teacher who absolutely, no, everyone would be totally cool with there being a teacher at this party who then goes home with one of them. Sting. Don't stand so close to me. Major plot developments over the next few episodes include Sam and Carla heading to London, where Sam is Will's baby and then gives her up for adoption. Will is released from prison and Craig's dad, real estate CEO, hires him, where he rises quickly up the ranks. But a spot of bribery gets out of hand and Will ends up informing on Craig's father. Meanwhile, Aaron does manage to hook up with Jenna for, like, 20 minutes, who then dumps him before moving to Seattle and dating a barista, Heather, who also dumps him. So, oh, hey, you're still here, finally hooks up with Carla, who, after the first best and only sex she's ever had with the man she's waited her whole life to have it with, comes up with the most convoluted reason not to accompany Aaron to Czechoslovakia in 1989. Why, yes, along with finally consummating this lovesick schoolgirl crush after years of pining away for him, she's also a photographer looking for her big break, and joining Aaron would put her in Prague on the eve of Huge regional shakeup that's been on the horizon ever since the fall of the Berlin Wall. Nah, you're right. Stan Bedford falls with not your boyfriend and be furious that Jenna dicked you over and shooting the People magazine layout promo for Hudson Hawk or something. But Carlo, of course, had already spent time in Europe accompanying Sam while she had Will's baby. And returning to the U.S., Sam learns who adopted her biological daughter, Amy, and confronts them in their home. They tell her to get lost, but lets them they're looking for a nanny. Oh, perfect! Carla applies and then takes the position. Carla then takes Amy to see Sam like, all the time, and then Will is also along once. When Sam sees Will with Amy, she's definitely torn about going through with her marriage to Craig, in which Will, of course, is Craig's best man. <laughs> All this drama comes to a head at the end of episode 4, 1989. Night of the rehearsal dinner, the feds come to arrest Craig's dad based on Will's testimony, and Craig kicks Will out of the wedding party. But Will shows up the next day, confronting Sam just as she's about to walk down the aisle, and Craig is outside, pounding on the door, making a big scene. Camera freezes on Sam's face, and fade to white. This all happens between 1986 and 1989. Here in the present day, one of these six friends has been murdered. All the suspicions have fallen on one of them having done it. And as I said, the show has been quite cagey about who even got murdered. We know it can't be Carla because this unusually motivated investigator, Matthew St. Patrick, as Detective Ken Marjorino, confronts her actually at the funeral. Then Will, who Ken confronts about the vehicular manslaughter, who he blames for stepfather's death 20 years before, that we all know it was Craig driving. The next friend revealed still alive at the end of episode 3 is Aaron, followed in episode 4 by paraplegic Craig, who is still insanely wealthy, paddling about in an Olympic-sized swimming pool, trying to equate killing Ken's stepfather with the loss of the use of his legs. I'd say we're even. Oh, my dude, it seems pretty clear to me that you've never met Detective Indico Martorino here, and incidentally, a gun can absolutely be fired from a wheelchair, so I don't see how this revelation clears you in the current investigation, especially since our detective has been impossibly vague about the details of this murder he's meant to be investigating. So, yeah, as of Episode 3, we learn that Will, Carla, and Aaron are still alive in 2006, and Episode 4 confirmed Craig is as well. So, Episode 5 is the coin flip, generous 
Sam. Jen or Sam? Well, it's Sam. Jen is still alive and Sam is... No, I haven't run into 1990 yet. Things to look forward to in my collection. It's just the summaries on IMDb have Craig and Will visiting Samantha's grave shortly and she's the only one of the six who would have one of those. She was in all the rest of the episodes. Lex Devil is the Sam and all the flashbacks and 13 episodes anyway that IMDb said we got off the run. Because... That really had to change, too, right? I mean, these friends who are so improbably still involved with each other's lives after high school, you'd think they'd all have new adventures and new friend groups. Goodness, Sam pre-med all of her medical training that comes out of nowhere. When'd she get that? We know from Grey's Anatomy they need to spend every waking hour with each other for their entire residency. When is she hanging out every single day with some nanny? Jenna, she's an actress. She's in music videos. She's in commercials. She's out promoting films. She'd have agents, co-stars, callbacks, readings. How is she also still spending all her time hanging out with his nanny? Carla is trying to be a professional photographer. How is she coordinating all of that? Plus, sneaking Sam in to see her daughter all the time. Well, dealing with the war zone that Amy's home is becoming. Craig and Will, my god, their lives are completely different. Will, Craig, and Sam spent an entire year apart becoming different people, and once Will returns from prison, finds Craig and Sam building the relationship, he's hanging on like a third wheel for two years. Hey, know what? Aaron figured out there were more than three women in the entire world and found someone. Will is gorgeous, blonde, buff, beautiful, and employed. He'd never want for company. It's just, there's no way they're all sort of emotionally entangled for four years. If he can't have Samantha, he'll just sit alone in the dark reading, and no one says anything at all about this before the day of the actual wedding. I mean, what is this, anyway? None of these people seem to have moms, either. Well, Jenna did. Her mom showed up at the big premiere party and slept with Jenna's director. She was awful. Jen's mom was awful. Craig's dad was corrupt. Carla's dad was a sweetie. Will's dad was just this hard-working dude who... Jeez, it seems like after Will sat in prison for nine months doing time for something his rich jag off of best friend actually did, and then once he was released, found that Sam wasn't out there waiting for him, and in fact was getting back together with Craig. I guess in the world of the show, Craig and his family hiring Will to an entry-level post is the least they could do, and actually Will should just be grateful for the opportunity, but generally... All of these people could have done with a lot more parental involvement. Ah, but where then would be the drama? The writers really milked this whole teens are stupid, make stupid decisions that affect their whole lives trope. Hooking up with your beau's best friend and getting pregnant, or giving up a child for adoption and then regretting it, or always pining for someone hopelessly out of your league while overlooking what's right there in front of you, or drunk driving resulting in vehicular manslaughter, or marrying the wrong person, or putting your career before your friend, or, 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 this show was a seething vat of emotional turmoil. I don't know if this way it would work as a teen drama. I mean, I'm not sure actual teens would recognize or believe these characters. It was the age all of them were supposed to be in 2006, and I didn't really recognize what little we were seeing at them then either. Most of what this show did was writers seeking the strongest dramatic and emotional impact while imagining ways of keeping people involved with each other who would go their very separate ways after high school. Then there's the murder itself, which... Structurally, it'd be tough to talk about much without giving away who it might be, which keeping shush was apparently important. The four episodes I've got certainly suggest any of the six friends might target any of the others, particularly since there are another 16 years of interactions, lies, betrayals, reprisals, and repercussions to explore, of which we know exactly nothing. All Detective Ken said explicitly is all five suspects had access to the victim within a few hours of, as it turns out, her death, but expanding that view... Either Craig or Will could have sufficient motive to murder Sam. I don't know what happens in episode 5, but she left Craig at the altar or ran from both of them. Previews showed Will joining the army or something. That could sow seeds of jealousy, rage, or antipathy. Previews also showed Sam's biological daughter Amy disappearing from Carla's care. If Sam kidnapped her, either of Amy's adopted parents could have targeted her, or Carla could have had to face any legal consequences for that disappearance. Prism? Where is that baby? Sorry, we just saw Cap shake some ports of being earnest. It's hilarious. Yeah, the kidnapping. Carla could have been lying about not knowing where the gun was. A show summaries indicated that the piece of evidence is turning up shortly, and without it, Ken couldn't really be sure of what he was looking at ballistics-wise. About Ken, there's a mystery I've been watching on Hulu called Death and Other Details, starring Mandy Patinkin as Detective Rufus Coltsworth, who early on schooled his young assistant protege, Violet Bean, as imaging a young woman who'd lost her mother early on and was focused like 
the laser on that who done it. If she spent the entire investigation looking to solve her mother's long time ago murder, she'd miss vital clues about the case at hand, a locked room mystery involving Rufus's other assistant apparently taking a harpoon to the gut in the middle of the night. In reunion, Ken has been staring at Will as the culprit for the current murder because of the car accident in 1986, readying himself for any opportunity to accuse him of anything at all since before he joined the force. But as Will pointed out, if Ken had bothered to check the blood work from that incident, he'd already know Will was the one driving, which by itself shows he was more interested in retribution than truth. Revealing himself as the stepson of Craig's drunk driving victim was most we learned from Ken about anything at all. And I'm sure as soon as it was made clear that Sam is the murderer victim we saw Ken's entire timeline and process board. Holding off on that allowed the writers to focus on who everyone was in the past. I'm sure that once the focus shifted to the present day, they started making actual progress on that story, too. One of the most important characters in this entire show I've yet to talk about, but now it's as good time as any. The soundtrack for this production is an entire character unto itself, with benchmark tunes by R.E.M., The Cure, Simple Minds, Madonna, Bon John, Bovey, Crowded House. Honestly, the production team knew how this stuff was going to play in a kind of an audience they were going to get, and even the production team couldn't have predicted how moving the rock set Listen to Your Heart song cue would be, playing it over Carla's confession of love to Aaron, and no way they could have known watching this 2024 post-lead singer Marie Fredericks passing. It's just a powerful scene. I think this show would do better if they tried it now, if only for makeup effects. I mean, I love all of these people, but none of them looked like they were pushing 40. Kyler Lee, geez, the insanely beautiful Kyler Lee looked like she was cosplaying Stacy mom. Same with Sean Ferris's Craig Rock that goatee all you like. You still look like a kid with a goatee. If they had access to the digital aging effects we have now, well, they look less like kids playing dress up and more like people 20 years in their own future. You'd think one of these guys would have a dad bod at least. Or yeah, Aaron, probably. But what I do not have access to is the online buzz a show like this would have been getting. I know in 20 out 5 and 20 out 6, an unhealthy chunk of my time was spent online chatting endlessly about shows I loved. And it feels like a show like this is tailor-made to generate endless, breathless online fan speculation. It does not appear to have had the necessary fan support. According to reporting at the Futon Critic, by November of 2005, it was barely holding on to two-thirds of the lead and audience from the OC, and averaging maybe four million viewers total. Again, fine for a cable production, but not for the amount of network money that was clearly being spent on it. As for this project, only four episodes have turned up so far, so it's too soon to say much about the overall quality of the production. Like I said, I'm not sure I even saw the whole thing. Murder mysteries are tough to plot under the best of circumstances, however, and according to IMDb, the show never even made it to the new millennium. It came back in the fall of 2006 after being off the air for most of a year, burning off four episodes over the course of three weeks. The flashback storyline never made it past 1998, and if it shut down before all 20 episodes aired, the show creators either had to make a lot of last-minute changes or just ended with no resolution at all. This is just fun to take a bit of time exploring this nostalgia bomb inside this nostalgia bomb and then see this take on the zeitgeist fascination with flashback storytelling. Cue simple minds on the way out. La, 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 you call my name. I associate many things with many things. Cross connection. Well, this one is easy, at least in regards to my Studio Murphy under challenge, tracking connections between shows in my archive through Aaron Sorkin's Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip, Alan Ball's Six Feet Under, and Ryan Murphy Productions. The lead investigator, Detective Ken Margarina, was played by Matthew St. Patrick of Six Feet Under, locking reunion directly in mystical centrality for my media collection, as well as for its preoccupation with nostalgia and time-jumping storylines. Another significant franchise connection, Kyler Lee played Meredith's sister Lexi Gray in six seasons of Grey's Anatomy, so James, we can do a connection through Six Feet Under as well. That's not all, however. I ran into an archive chat room I was part of at the time, about 20 years ago now, talk about Preserved in Amber, where friends of mine from Joss Whedon's Angel Forum and I were discussing reunion in real time as it aired. It was pointed out to me that one of the leads, Alexa Davalos, had played Gwen Radin in Angel, and just from the opening credits, I knew Dave Annable was in Brothers and Sisters with Rachel Griffiths, also from Six Feet Under, so the show is smack dab. Other Joss 
Philosopher's Connections I found in this set. Dagny Kerr, Buffy's roommate in Season 4, playing a nurse in Desperate Housewives, but also featured Marley Matlin, a direct alum of West Wing, only a step away from Studio 60 via Bradley Whitford at Al. Also spotted in episodes of Desperate Housewives stirring up this set were Leslie Ann Warren from Clue, Bob Newhart from Newhart, and Bob Gunton from Ryan Murphy's Nip Tuck. And from Parks and Rec, an early sighting of Ben Schwartz and John Raffio in that production, playing a movie blogger in Jenna Elfman's 20 out 9 sitcom, accidentally on purpose. And now... I have children quite a bit. Book Report. Like with Harper's Island in episode 76, a big reason I chose to power through four episodes of the Murder Mystery Reunion this time was to set the right tone to talk about some mystery fiction I've devoured in the past month or two here. The first entry, well, I may as well introduce both of them at the same time. I encountered The Fury, a novel by Alex Michaelides, and he is interviewed on All About Agatha by podcaster Kemper Donovan, the author of the second book I read, The Busybody. Oh, and quick heads up, both The Fury and The Busybody are brand spanking new releases I have no intention of spoiling anything, but I feel I can seed a few breadcrumbs to let you know what you're in for. All About Agatha has been celebrated multiple times in this podcast over the years. I found it to be a delightfully well-researched and well-presented source of insight and recommendations. So, as I'm only halfway through my listening to Kemper's interview with him, I felt I needed to track down The Fury by Alex Michaelides. First, have you ever watched Fool Us by Penn and Teller on the WB? Magicians with, let's say, a range of talents and abilities take the stage to perform illusions for arguably one of the top acts in Vegas. Penn and Teller view the performances and then seed hints and references about the act we all just watched together, letting the performer know that they've seen through their little stunt. Nine times out of ten, maybe even more often, the performer acknowledges the veil has been pierced and they did not, in fact, fool the masters. A few brazen it out and the host admit they have, in fact, been fooled, handing the performer a trophy prominently emblazoned with a giant F.U. for fooled us, which is the only thing I could stand for. What? Without spoiling anything exactly, Kemper and Alex chatted breezily about the various titles Alex may have drawn inspiration from in the writing of this book. The author found chiefly inspirational. Ford Maddox Ford meant nothing to me, and I was intrigued by the structure he drew from the early 20th century work The Good Soldier. Then they got a little too clever for themselves and touched on Christie works Alex might have been inspired by, and here my familiarity with the canon was a little too informed for whatever great twist, aha, surprise reveal that may have been lying in wait for me by the end. But that was no real consequence, because I found tasty little reveals seated throughout the novel. To share a, I hope, somewhat less spoilery take on the title, our narrator, Elliot Chase, has found success as a playwright, having done a bit of social climbing and clambering into a rather an artistic and creative circle of friends, including no less a presence than movie star Lana Farrer, who, apart from her impressive filmography portraying tragic heroines on the silver screen, you may recall from her own rather tragic demise on her private island in the Mediterranean Ronnie somewhere while getting away from things in London and bringing some of them along. In the persons of her teenage son Leo, her philandering husband Jason, her theatrical frenemy Kate Crosby, her trusted attendant Agathy, and the groundskeeper Nikos. With our narrator that makes seven on the island, shut off from help or any assistance by the titular store, whipping round the place the night of Lana's murder, we learn a bit more about everyone, including Elliot, through his history with cantankerous author and housemate, the late Barbara West whom he conjures into view whenever he needs to reveal backstory or points of character about Lana, Kate, or himself, everyone in this devastating milieu. Read it, do. It's a fun, easy, quite scandalous read full of suspense and misdirection, who killed who and where. Despite our friend and trusted narrator's assurance that it is at its core a love story, the murder looms pretty much unavoidably throughout as a preoccupation and inevitability. Motives rise and get shot through with each new revelation and ill reality this book bears multiple reads to completely get your head around what actually happened and why. I do not wholeheartedly recommend it as a murder mystery, but I do wholeheartedly recommend it. Well done, Alex Michaelides. Our appetite thus whetted for our main course, I'd like to introduce you to The Busybody by Kemper Donovan. In The Busybody, our narrator is tapped to ghostwrite a memoir for Dorothy Gibson, a high-profile New England senator who happened to secure a third of the popular vote in a recent presidential race, losing to a terrible person, which I'm sure none of us can relate to. But it amused me to picture Hillary Clinton and Velma clambering around in the wilderness in upstate New York, solving mysteries. Why not? That's the touch Kemper's taken with this novel. The 
ghostwriter in this storytelling remains a ghost, nameless, sort of vaguely self-deprecating physical descriptions. Call me Lady Cyrano because I got a big nose. And she indicates some discomfort of her physical presence, so she certainly caught the attention of the sapiosexual bodyguard attached to Senator Gibson's security team. Denny Peters is the irresponsibly beautiful bodyguard she discovers to her horror reading her juvenilia, a romance novel she wrote before she ever started telling the life stories of high-profile people. She privately congratulates Dorothy's team for being so thorough, but really wishes the bodyguard would read her more recent work. It's not all second dates and flirting eyebrows. Our ghost finally meets Dorothy herself in her wooded retreat in Maine and is taken in entirely by her energy, drive, and charisma. Since she'll be writing the whole Dorothy Quartz and all, Ghosty accompanies her everywhere, including a wine run where fans staying nearby snaps a selfie with Dorothy that ends up going viral when she is found dead, apparently by suicide, but was in fact murdered. Well, the fan wasn't just anyone. She was Vivian Gray, wife of the biomedical innovator trying to help burn victims. Vivian was running a Kickstarter, capitalizing on the president-elect's unpopularity, in which she promised to engage in various theatrics to demonstrate public resentment against him, including chaining herself to the White House fence. Naturally, the sensation of her widely circulated peck with Senator Gibson came up as part of the police investigation, and since they'd been lodging at the next property over, Dorothy and Ghosty walked across and conducted their own inquiries, discovering covering intrigue and artifice, as well as a sister, Laura, who arrived on the scene to, among other revelations, defend her late sister's honor. So, together with high-profile questions of fidelity, medical ethics, and venture capital, not to mention a heady romance worthy of the novel Denny had been thumbing through early on, Dorothy and Ghosty race to solve a mystery lest a murderer strikes again. <laughs> I promise in Greg Crumbs my instinct is to let you fend for yourself. Kemper's narrator, her tone of voice, reminds me of Sue Grafton's detective Kinsey Milhone, which makes for scintillating reading. Plus, a couple of parallels occurred to me with the writing of thriller writer Janet Vonovich, mostly the sexual energy bristling off the page between Ghosty and the Bodyguard. Both combined to drag a reader through this book by the nose. And since that makes for a relatively quick read, kick back, relax, and enjoy the ride. Both The Fury, as is Alex's third release, and the busybody Kepper's debut murder mystery are available everywhere. They both make for fantastic reading experiences, and as always, I can highly recommend Kemper's podcast all about Agatha. Check them out. Also, as before, we rejoin our podcast, Video Fuzzy, already in progress. Mm, diving into my classic collection. In cataloging discs 1551 through 1575 in my VHS to DVD transfers, I hit a minor milestone I'd like to take exactly this month time talking about. Not too long ago, I passed the halfway mark in this cataloging effort. With this set, I officially have fewer than 1,000 discs left to catalog. <laughs> Yep, my classic collection has 2,570 discs in it. I started this podcasting effort in 2017 with Disc 229, so in about seven years I've cataloged 1,346 discs. The fact that as of episode 92 I now have only 995 discs remaining to catalog it seems like the end is absolutely... A good long ways away, yep, yeah, but at least 40 more of these. But I figured it'd be helpful even to me to recall that this project has been, not always, like this time for instance, it's been quite a lot of work, but it has been a truly fun way to share this experience and keep me working away on it. And genuinely cool stuff has turned up. Episode before last of my soundtrack effort, which, by the way, is having a lot of trouble finding its audience. So if you get a chance, check it out. And if anyone you know likes, you know, music, maybe recommend it. Anyway, my houses installment, I talked about Good Charlotte and the fan video I'd put together for The River with clips from the pilot episode of Holly Hunter's Saving Grace. I found their actual music video released for I Just Want to Live in this set, Disc 1552, and gotta say, it is just so cool to have that. As the song plays, band members cosplay a band with a gimmick. All of them dress up as food, like they perform and play their instruments dressed as pizza, a burger, a carrot, a strawberry. One of them is dressed as corn on the cob. Anyway, the video has them playing tiny concerts, can't get a break. Then a producer discovers them, and they start having success, climbing the charts, and then what happens to bands and band members when they start getting famous and the pressure of success gets to them? Tabloid coverage starts souring, and fans move on to the next thing. It's dark, but... At no point did it seem unbelievable. 
I had them in here with Ciara's collaboration with Missy Elliott, One Two Step. Also, a really cool music video that seems to celebrate amateur dancers. Also, Linkin Park's somewhat prescient Breaking the Habit entry that seemed to portray a band member's suicide, and Ashley Simpson's La La. This was a good one for music. I had 20 out 5 entries from Austin City Limits on Spoon and The Killers, which I've also got their Jazz Age themed Mr. Brightside video in this set. I had Gwen Stefani's Outlandish Rich Girl and J Lo's complicated Get Right Art. Archived, Destiny's Child, Madonna, Lindsay Lohan, Green Day, Motley Crue, and also Velvet Revolver's Dirty Little Thing featuring heavy metal-esque animation. From Late Night, I had Fiona Apple playing O Sailor on Leno. I had Emo Phillips doing a set on Conan O'Brien, which is hilarious, as well as Conan's plans for sweeps weeks uh, involved bobbleheads in some capacity. And on discs 1568 and 1569, I found I had the first episode that aired of The Tonight Show following the passing of Johnny Carson, January 23rd, 2005. Jay Leno hosted, and I think the tone was respectful. I mean, Johnny Carson had been hosting a comic talk and variety show for three decades, stepping down in 1992, and the guests that came on to talk with Jay about him were a good reflection of his time at the desk, including co-host Ed Mann himself. They had Bob Newhart, Don Rickles, Drew Carey, and musical guest Katie Lang, which was cool. And, oh, wow, the clips they'd put together, they had ready for this show. They had some funniest moments and also featured top names that got their start on The Tonight Show, including Ellen DeGeneres, honestly, looking like half a page out of my yearbook at the time, Roseanne Barr, Gary Shandling, hell, Jay Leno himself, unforgivably absent from well, the hosting chair and the retrospective was Joan Rivers, which, geez, guy, the man is dead, just accidentally mentioned that she was a regular guest. It feels like it would have been a, well, unless she herself had refused, but they'd been friends for years. There'd have been clips to include, but that's out here as a fan. Who knows how contracts are written and hard feelings persist. Other highlights, I found several episodes of Desperate Housewives in this set, as well as several episodes of Missing, starring Vivica A. Fox and Katarina Scorsone, who went on to a starring role in Grey's Anatomy. If I hadn't featured Reunion this time, a good candidate would have been Tim Daly vehicle, hyperkinetic, David E. Kelly-esque production of Eyes, featuring A.J. Langer and Eric Mabius, staffing a firm of private investigators who gain way over their heads and emerge victorious every single time. How do they do it? I found pilot episodes and several entries beyond that, and I was definitely holding my attention. I won't be able to spend the time with it. I probably should now, but I'm happy to see it showed up. Also, episodes of Alias continue to turn up, and it's very cool, along with several episodes of Lost, including the pilot episodes, which I think they re-aired ahead of the first season finale. Speaking of Eric Mabius, I found another Ugly Betty where Justin is named Homecoming Queen and uses the spotlight to honor his mother. It was very moving. Also, episodes of V, Monk, White Collar, Brothers and Sisters, Mercy, Bones, and Oh, wow, Fringe. I found an Observer episode. Very cool. I mentioned Emo Phillips. I found a loud, angry set by Dennis Leary from 1997, and movies. Oh, wow, well. I found an ABC made-for-TV movie taking us behind the scenes of a primetime soap called Dynasty, the making of a guilty pleasure, and WB aired Heathers, which was... Yeah. Loved this set. Cannot wait to see what I turn up next. And now... Checking out my current collection. For my current direct-to-digital collection, the part of this installment that's probably taken the most time and energy is the Doctor Who portion of it. Comments on a four-part 60th anniversary special. I've taken several runs at this, first making individual comments on each installment that plays not well, however, especially the airing of these specials receipts into the ravenous past. So, I'll begin with a comment. There will be spoilers. If you've not yet watched the four parts of the 60th anniversary special, they are well worth watching. They are available on Disney+, Plus, and if you're planning to watch season one in April, as the Disney people are referring to it, then watching the specials is absolutely going to help. I'm not even going to attempt to talk about a self-contained miniseries that transitioned the one Doctor into another, and then into the current Iteration. All of the adventures involved with that without spoiling anything. Begin here. David Tennant popped up again, reprising his well-beloved take on his title role. If Matt Smith was too young, if Peter Capaldi was too old, or Jodie Whittaker was too much of a girl, no fears. Everyone's favorite doctor, the one who bridged across from Grumpy McLeatherkit, the establishment of Torchwood, to a reconnection with Sarah Jane Smith, tying the new series to the old, and brought in John Sim as the master. He faced down the Daleks and Cybermen while handing off from Rose Tyler to Martha Jones to Donna Noble. In fact, 
first episode of the special, The Star Beast, opened with loose ends to tie off at the end of the Donna Noble arc. The metacrisis foreseen by the Ood entangled their consciousness and Donna's human brain incapable of containing it. Before leaving Donna in the care of her family, Doc walled off that part of her brain and warned if she ever remembered who she was, her brain would explode and she would die. So him running into her in the streets of London in the midst of Christmas sales and preparations seemed like a bad thing. She was out doing the shopping with her husband, a cab driver, and their daughter, Rose. Donna did not recognize him, but had a word of advice. You can wear suits that tight up to the age of 35 and no further. The episode does spend a clanky amount of time re-establishing Unit, puzzling out whether the Star Beast, a meep, is a sweet and this little endangered thing being hunted down for its soft fur, or maybe the last remaining meep being pursued across the galaxy to answer for their crimes, who's to say, and during which time keeping us all in suspense as to whether Donna will recognize the Doctor and have a explosion. Well... Since she appears in the next two installments, let's just cover this. Donna gave birth to her daughter, Rose, assigned male at birth and a dead named once in the show, but never here. Donna is the most supportive and protective mama lion she could ever have had, but in giving birth, she passed some of that metacritical energy to her daughter, and between them, they could survive the spark-free awakening. Donna was able to help the doctor shut down the most contrived puzzle ever. Doc needed her to be the other half of his brain so they could shut down the Meep spacecraft design as it was to destroy everything with in a five-mile radius in order to launch. There were these cracks splitting open the streets of London. No worries, though. As the episode ends, all the cracks in the street just close up again. And I was like, what? Anyway, after shutting down the shuttle launch and the space bug police taking the Meep into custody, Donna suggests that between her and her daughter, they could do something with the excess regenerative energy that no male-presenting Time Lord could do, which was just let it go. And they did. Time Lord, binary, non-binary. Absolutely fascinating callback to the Metacrisis we witnessed in 2008, end of season four, Journey's End, and zero potential that that was planned at the time. It was perfect. Second installment, Wild Blue Yonder. Oh, I guess I am just going in order. Well, post Donna dumps a mug of coffee into the Eye of Harmony, there's a short and, I think, world-shifting stop to make in 1666 where they encounter Isaac Newton inventing gravity, except through mishearing a truly dad joke from Donna, he ends up calling it Mavity. And it's a neat little shibboleth, because it's not an especially common word, but it's always breezily floating around in sci-fi productions. Check the Mavity, good Mavity readings, turn on the artificial Mavity, the first installment reference Gravity While Drives, and Gravity is only said one additional time in the run of the series, the Doctor catching himself and becoming aware that he's in an alternate timeline when he actually helped usher in. The TARDIS blueys off beyond boundaries of the known universe into a ginormous spaceship with shades of the Capaldi era world enough in time. Doc and Donna encounter Marvin the Paranoid Android, essentially, and a pair of creepy doppelgangers who look just enough like each of them but fool the other, but have difficulty maintaining their own forms. Doc sets down rules for formless ones to enter our universe, including they can't cross a line of salt without they first count every grain. The uh, rule is weighing on him as he repairs the bluey and heads back to discover London is erupting in chaos. The third installment, The Giggle, concerns one of these formless beings that can make, remake, bend, and then break physical laws with the power of thought. Elder Nemesis from the Bill Hartnell run, the Celestial Toymaker, played the parking lot by Neil Patrick Harris. Puppet energy deriving from the first televisual image ever broadcast is burned into every screen on the planet, and once activated by a South Korean satellite that brings the entire world virtually online, sparks the subconscious certainty that everything you think is right. A lot of people behave this way generally, but in this case, practically everyone is acting on these impulses and civilization is having a breakdown. It does suggest a representation of the sounds being made could be a musical scale, <laughs> so maybe it could be countered. Indeed, Unit crafted a damper so they could focus, and Doc and Donna head back to investigate the origin of this broadcast and find the toy maker just down the block. There's a chase and a showdown, and then the doctor sat down to confront some hard realities, the final days of Amy Pond, Clara Osborne, and Bill Potts, each of which the doctor mumbles the retcon engineered into the show so children don't have to deal with their favorite characters dying. Amy died of old age. Clara's life force was drawn from her the final seconds of her life, Bill's intergalactic energy being. And to each of these assertions, the toy maker retorts, oh, well, that's
that's all right then. The message being, look, you put your friends in danger and you need to take the time you're going to need to take. Not all this running around tangling into the next misadventure with the next disposable companion. This is especially rough for this iteration of this character since he did reconnect with Sarah Jane Smith and then she passed. And so briefly reconnecting with Wilford and then reconnecting with Mel and Kate Lethard Stewart, Una, the toy maker endangered their lives right in front of his eyes and the doctor just okay save this specific day first but my god take the time you need to heal i mentioned bill hartnell's doctor showdown with the toy maker tenets was the lowest energy simple cut of a deck lost highest card wins then the toy maker summoned a third doctor to meet the best of three challenge shooting hot one the first ever visualized by generation move where david may finally evicted the watcher from the end of the tom baker run needed a watcher before what the hell the toy maker produced a new doctor to play with they played catch on the launch platform of unit the toy maker bobbled the final catch it's weird because he just demonstrated access to Toontown physics in this spice up your life entrance ahead of the showdown. Well worth watching on a loop for several minutes. If you know, you know. He was trapped inside his own pocket dimension, buried in salt beneath the unit itself. That was a question the doctor was struggling with. Did his TARDIS malfunction universe remaking interaction with the formless ones at the edge of reality make it possible for the toy maker and others to claw their way in? The toy maker warned of one he himself never wanted to face, as we see this, let's call it the Mavity universe, it's beings that run on coincidence, bad luck, a language of ropes, and magic is just a different kind of physics. Douglas Adams gave us an improbability drive, and if you ever saw everything everywhere all at once, you can envision a universe like this, but I think the show has struggled with wanting magic to be real. The story of sleep monsters, the god complex, the curse of the black spot. Oh, wow, I really mean the Dream Lord, which is the best candidate I've ever seen for the Bell Yard post Colin Baker's run. But post Tenet and Gatwa vanquishing the toy maker, Tenet had to step back. As Gatwa said, they're time lords, they're doing their therapy out of order. Tenet parks his TARDIS and Donna's and begins the work of healing himself and Got what takes his shiny new, still type for TARDIS on into the universe. All the way across town, it looks like he meets Ruby Sunday again because he... Okay, look, the new season begins next month. All you need to know is that having opened this universe to the formless ones and their trippy energies and magical physics, this doctor's perfectly okay with destroying them. Other doctors might have had a little scruple at the idea of destroying an entire ship full of goblins along with the Goblin King, but to save the infant human they were intent on devouring, not Lulabelle, Although she was definitely at that end of the firing range, but rather the infant Ruby Sunday, where they'd actually gone back in time, having seasoned her existence with powerfully bad mojo. The goblins had kidnapped her and were planning to eat her, probably at the climax of a towering song and dance number. Yeah, the Mavity universe is a strange one. And I think this is the point of creating it. The Mavity universe, the one where the Doctor let in the formless ones, the one where goblins and magic is a thing, is kind of like the Pandorica or the Reapers or Alternate Reality Rose or Harold Saxon or E-Space or all kinds of alternate realities this show creates so as to run spacecraft through the Big Ben or the moon is a giant mostly off-camera spider egg. We don't all wonder why we don't remember that happening. New Doctor Shurigatwa has his own timeline. Whether he spends any energy stitching it back up with ours or just continues to protect ours from it is, I suppose, something we'll get to see as the series resumes. But I love his energy. He's young, he's smart, freaking beautiful. He is snazzy with the outfits, a little flirty, and, you know, I think it's kind of fun to expand the range of Doctors we've seen. Far as I can recall, Joe, the fugitive Doctor, is the first iteration of a Doctor of Color, but in no way was she the first Time Lord or Lady of Color, a general director during the Time War, regenerated from an elderly white male to a young black woman. All that altered from her subordinates was Sir to Mum. And not even this character, since the story retcon infusing regeneration of the Gallifreyan genome, was a timeless child who fell through a rift in a void, died, and regenerated into quite the broadest range of humanoids. Oh, then Romana de Vratnalunda, one of the regeneration she tried, was sort of cerulean, I think, before she morphed into Tom Baker's girlfriend at the time. River Song was black once, but she was human. She only had regenerative energy because she was conceived by Amy and Rory's honeymoon while traveling through the vortex. And then, and then, and then, and right. So, yeah, it's going to be fun. Every new Doctor expands the role, and while I'm not immediately enamored of his flip phone Sonic, it's likely better go than whatever Jody cobbled together in a greenhouse at Sheffield. So, uh, onward. <laughs> 
as for everything else, I wish I had more time to watch shows right now. I saw the second season of Surreal Estate showed up on Hulu, and I was like, ooh, the second season premiere was really good, but I haven't seen any more of it since. Same with Feud, Truman Capote, and the Swans. The show is absolutely fantastic, well-written, beautifully realized, and if I were more interested in dishy, queer-coded gossip from the 1960s, I'd be all over this. And that's in no way saying I am not. Ryan Murphy does a great job with these, and I will dive back in when I get a chance. I've also been loving, I've mentioned up there, Death and Other Details with Mandy Patinkin and Violet Bean, which essentially knives out on a cruise ship exquisitely appointed and deliciously risque. Mild spoilers from here, but the ship is pretty stuffed with detectives by the end. Yeah, between Imogene and Rufus, ship security and Interpol, airlifting the bad guy into the fray after several murders and shocking reveals have taken place seems, A, not that smart, and two, kind of full focus, but oh well. Ooh, quick updates as I just watched the finale. Notice everything, assume nothing. Advice from the start, and I do play fair. The writing and visual storytelling is incredibly subtle, and it's just like in Glass Onion. I was never going to notice a massive clue in the series premiere, but damn, the payoff is sensational. Track it down, check it out. It is worth your time. Other mysteries I have been chugging along through mid-80s self-reverential nostalgia fair episodes of Moonlighting and got into season two some, I got as far as the lady in the iron mask, which I remember watching real time the first time around. The only thing missing was Mr. Pesto as a fifth veiled lady sliding into the dog pile at the end. <laughs> And silly as that might well be, I feel it's better than Obituary, also on Hulu, which, as far as I could tell, is Dexter, but in Tiny Killraven, an Irish town of 5,000, where an improbably talented writer who's paid by the obituary is motivated to rustle up some business for herself by finding terrible people to kill and then killing them. The deaths, she determines, all need to look like suicide, misadventures, acts of God, or natural causes. And you know what? The pilot episode, the police officer stops by her vehicle because she is parked sitting in it, not doing anything. The demand she opened her trunk, zero probable cause. You know, if law enforcement is this intrusive, this may not be a great town to go stealth serial killer. I don't know. Someone had a crazy idea, turned it into a script, and someone filmed it, so I guess I'll probably keep watching it for a bit. A word about Fargo. I've enjoyed every season of this homespun crime series, but this one, set in 2019 around a home invasion goes back ass sideways, this one with Jennifer Jason Lee and Dave Foley at the head of a collections empire, a constitutional sheriff outside of Dickinson tracking his estranged wife to the Twin Cities exurbs and her new life and family, just, this is already too long, that this dead-eyed hit fellow secured to take out said wife, giving him a backstory that stretches back to the Dark Ages, all the delicious callbacks to the Coen Brothers movie. It just made me so happy. John Hamm, Juno Temple, Richard Warjohn, Sam Spruill, just David Reisdahl, Lamorne Morris. Look, I do not know how Noah Hawley does it. I don't. He pulls in the most ridiculously talented people and puts together the most incredible shows. Living here, I wouldn't anticipate we were this fertile soil for his brand of storytelling, but my land, he has accepted that challenge time and again and knocked it clear out of the park. I love it. I friggin' love it. Characters rang true. Situations were outlandish, but with the right balance of verisimilitude. And okay, yeah, sure. Dickinson, like I said elsewhere, Dickinson's not where you'd find a lot of patience with Roy Tillman's approach to sheriffing, but you can't stand outside the story and to tell anyone the mindset doesn't exist. It's an incredible story told incredibly well. I just applaud the work. Just seriously, well done, everyone. What else? Well, Ralph and I have just finished the first season of The Floor with host Rob Lowe. It's a fun idea. 81 contestants with their own areas of expertise, such as U.S. states and birds or historic headlines, go up against each other to answer trivia or identify images on a screen. I guess maybe there's increasing levels of difficulty as they go on, although one contestant's first image of the category of travel destinations was the Sagrada Familia, so in all reality, I could have stared at that the entire round. Those words would never have come out of my mouth. There are no penalties for incorrect answers beyond your clock continues to run. You can pass, but you lose three seconds before the next image appears on your screen. The player with time remaining at the end of their challenge wins or keeps the area they've secured a title character, the floor, and decides whether they want to further expand their domain or return to the floor and defend. There's definitely strategy involved. The player controlling the most space at the end of the hour wins $20,000, and the last one standing wins $250,000. I'm so glad this is available on Hulu, and I'm so glad I sprung for 
the no commercials version because this game has a lot of commercial breaks. Also, the season seems to run maybe a dozen episodes. It'll be interesting to see how it does. It's a fun game to play along with, and I absolutely understand people blaking out of the right answers. It's definitely a trivia game for the Instagram generation. Lots of big, colorful pictures and fill in the blanks, and anyone who remembers Trivial Pursuit will scoff a bit at this format, but in all reality, it can be pretty challenging as players stumped by a rolling pin, Sarah Palin, or an eyelash curler can attest. And I just turned 54. Part of my birthday celebration, Ralph took me to Olive Garden, a couple of movies, Argyle and Wonka. Argyle was a brilliant, sneaky little spy caper, full of twists, absolutely loved it. Catherine O'Hara was phenomenal. Wonka builds the origin story for Roald Dahl's master chocolatier with his head full of dreams, stepping off a ship in London from travels that have taken him around the world in all its wondrous, sumptuous, and magical flavors, but in no way prepared him for a corrupt cabal of craven corporatists, a corpulent chief constable, or a knight landlady laundress and her creepy concierge. Well, he sets about turning his fortunes around into a delightfully engaging story, not significantly damaged by the musical someone decided it should be, or the somewhat intrusive over-alliance of computer animation, even for a story like this. Fun show, though. Finally, I mentioned we'd gotten over to the Capital Shakespeare production of The Importance of Being Earnest last month, and oh, wow, it was a truly wonderful production. I chatted about my experience directing Oscar Wilde's scathing social satire in 2001 in episode 17, enjoying a few finalies, and it was great sitting back watching what Chad, Importance of Being Earnest director Chad Litton, did with these hilarious characters and their farcical interactions. Obviously, I'm biased towards my cast, but this nutty bunch of rascals took it all on with great skill and energy, building the this comic social satire of mistaken identity and mischievous seekery to the towering climax. It was a perfectly wonderful night of theater. It's very well done. But with that, I must really finally get this into the feed. Thank you all for checking in my video cataloging project. You can check out my catalog listing along with audio links at videofuzzy.blogspot.com fast episodes, add subscribe or follow Video Fuzzy wherever you get your podcasts. And if you get a chance, check out my Video Fuzzy the soundtrack entries as well. Feedback is always appreciated and you can contact me through my blog or podcast sites via email djama1970 at yahoo.com or through my Video Fuzzy pages on Facebook, Instagram, and threads. For Video Fuzzy, I'm Terry J. Amin. Happy viewing! It might be amazing, it might just be scuzzy, we'll find it together on Video Fuzzy.